We are uh, we're heading into some some intense, challenging scriptures today, and you know Paul and Steve they took all the easy scriptures the last couple of weeks. So uh, we've been going through the the book of First Peter together, and so we just go where the Lord leads us. And this week He's leading us to some challenging stuff. And so I would ask as we head into the scripture today that you would you'd lean in with me as we pray, uh, that we're praying that God has just the right thing for each and every one of us. We're going we're gonna to hit on some tough topics along the way, and I'm praying that we have the grace and the, the openness of what God might want to do in each of our lives. Um, stay with me as we, as we navigate through the verses, because the second half is really where I really want to feel led to punch us on. Uh, well, not punch us. That is so aggressive. Um, but I really want to help highlight for us. Um, so yeah, so we're going to pray about that. And, and I'm just, we had such a great time at the last service. So every time I get up here, I pray, God, what's the fresh thing you have for this service? I don't want to reheat the leftovers for you all. And I didn't use half of the notes last time. So maybe we'll use the other half with you guys. Okay. All right. Can we pray together? Just want to make sure you're awake. You're a little, little sloggy. I've, you know, I've been gone. I'm, I'm fresh and rested. So all right. you are ready. Good. Okay. Here we go. Pray with me. Pray with me. God. Oh, God, it was so good to see you at work last service, and I know you are not done. You have something fresh for each and every one of us in this service today. And so we wait on you, we rest on you, we, 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 we stand on the promises that we've sung and declared already this morning. We know that you are here, you are here, and you want to meet with every one of us. We know that your spirit is on the move, we know that your word is alive and active, and so, God, we come hungry and desperate to meet with you today. And as we enter into some tough scripture today, I am praying afresh that you would do in every life what needs to be done today. There may be some things and some lives that have nothing to do with what we're preaching on today, but we give you permission to do what you need to do in this place. We come open, we come hungry. We join with, with churches around the world today as we pray for, for peace and healing and, and, a rec- and, and just, just, you know the situation in Israel, God. And so we lay it at your feet. We know you love those people. You know you hate the violence. And so we're praying for your will to be done. We're praying for healing and we're praying for the violence to stop. And God, even as we pause and we join with Christians around the world today, I'm reminded that you are doing a great work. So we as a church want to join with that great work you have for us. Do that work in our lives so that we can go and be a part of what you call us to. We are hungry for you. Lead us, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, uh, growing up, I had heard the name Nelson Mandela I didn't know much about who this guy was or, or what his story was. I just knew he was some, some, some political leader in Africa. But a number of years ago when the movie Invictus came out, uh, this, this movie that kind of uh, chronicled some of Mandela's life and this rugby football team that, was, that, that he was connected with, uh, I became very intrigued. Like, who is this man? What's his story all about? And, and, and today I want to reflect a little bit on his story uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, he is a beautiful illustration of some of the truth we're going to see in the scriptures today. I will say this, as we, as we talk about Mandela, first of all, he was not a Christian. Secondly, he was not a perfect man by any means and did a lot of not great things. Uh, but there's, there's something related to the theme we're going to see in the text today that I, I want us to hang out with a little bit. So if you don't know anything about Nelson Mandela, he was, uh, he was born as an indigenous person in South Africa. Uh, he was born really into to royalty. Uh, and and he, he comes up and grows up in a time in which there was great, um, great violence, great racism, apartheid, was this, this, this political system that was so uh, horrific. And as, as Mandela, who was a, a natural leader and, and, and grew in maturity and wisdom and educated himself well, would, would, would be kind of thrust into a leadership position with some of the anti-apartheid movements. That's where he would uh, get the attention of, of, of government officials who were against that. That's where, uh, he would, that's where he would step into some, some, some not great things. But eventually, in his 40s, he would get arrested by the government and he would go on trial, trial for high treason. 
And the, because Mandela was such a key figure in, in this anti-apartheid movement, the government made quite a spectacle of him and some of the other leaders. And so eventually he was found guilty of, of high treason against the government. And for some of the things that he was accused of you know, were legitimate, but many of the things were, 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 were heaped on to his case. So much so that he was given uh, the sentence of life imprisonment, but, but he was actually, there were people who were for pushing for his execution. That's how severe, uh, severely um, uh, in, the, in the target he was as he went off to prison. So as he goes to prison, life imprisonment, he's in his mid-40s at this point, a political prisoner, uh, and he's sent to Robben Island, this island off the coast of South Africa. And it's, it's a, a prison for some of the most dangerous criminals. He's given a category of one of the most dangerous criminals in South Africa, and, and he is treated harshly. He, the, the, the guards are harsh to him. He's put in a little eight foot by seven foot prison cell, a cell in which he would live for uh, decades. He's forced to go out and do manual labor, um, uh, crushing rocks and working in limestone quarries. And so much so that, that, that he, would, uh, bec- I don't know, he would have some vision issues over time because of the glare of the limestone. It was a, it was a horrible situation for a man, not perfect, but a man who really was treated poorly by, his, by the government and, and, and had all this, this unjust stuff done to him. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Imagine you are in Mandela's shoes. Imagine that you are uh, kind of uh, put in a position where you are treated unjustly, where, 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 where people in authority uh, treat you unfairly. How would you respond uh, the question we all need to wrestle with today is how do we respond when, when, when things are hard? How do we respond when those in authority over us are, are not kind to us, are, 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 are harsh to us and wound us? And, and we'll come back to Mandela's story in a moment. But I want you to, to, to have that image in our head as we go to our scriptures today. Because here's a man treated so poorly and he would literally sit <laughs> marinating in that harsh treatment for decades. And what is going to happen with his story? We'll come back to that at the end. If you have brought your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 today. And there's a question we want to ask, and as I mentioned just a second ago, how do we respond when things don't, don't go the way we want? And especially when people of, of power and authority over us treat us that way, how do we respond when things don't go the way we want, when we're hurt, when we're wronged? Now, last week, Pastor Paul took us to verse, uh, well, we were in, in verses 9 and 10, and I want to I go there before we go to our text today, because in that text, he, he reminds us who he's writing to, who the, the Apostle Peter uh, writes this letter to, to Christians scattered throughout some of the outermost areas of, of the, the Roman Empire. These are Christians who have experienced some really harsh conditions many of which are already starting to suffer. Some are already being persecuted. But, but Peter knows coming from Rome that more persecution, more harsh treatment is coming from the government and from others who aren't Christians. So he writes this letter to a people who are struggling, to a people who will struggle, to a people who need hope in the midst of struggling. And we love this letter because it's written to ordinary people like you and I, people who are kind of on the outskirts, who might be struggling with any number of different things. And in, in verses 9 and 10, we see what Pastor Paul took us last week to see who he's addressing. He's addressing the Christians then, and he's ag- addressing you and I, Christians in this room, and even watching online today. Listen to how Peter describes you and I who follow Jesus. Verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of light, out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And last week, Pastor Paul took us to each of those. What does it mean to be chosen? What does it mean to be the part of this royal priesthood? And if you miss it, go back and watch that sermon. But we need this reminder as we head into some hard teaching today. We need to be reminded of who we are. Being clear on our identity as followers of Christ really matters to us. Because when we face challenges, when we're called to higher standards, it has to come from the perspective of, do you know who you are? Do you know what your identity is a follower of Jesus? 
You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. You're a part of a holy nation. And it's that just few verses earlier that tees us up for this hard teaching today. You ready? I'm not confident that you're ready. Okay, here we go. Verse 13, Romans 2, Romans chapter, whoa, not Romans. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit. <laughs> we'll just leave it right there. No, submit yourselves, for, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Oh, Cray, we're going to have fun today, aren't we? Whenever we talk about submission in, in the scriptures, we need to go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. I'm not going to turn there. You don't need to go. That's very short. Uh, the Apostle Peter in Ephesians 5, verse 21 says, uh, submit to one another out of reverence for, uh, out of reverence to Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Anytime we see the teachings in the New Testament talk about submission, the idea of yielding oneself, yielding one's life and will to others, or as I like to think of it, submission, it's submitting my mission to somebody else's mission. Whenever we think of submission, we go to 521, Ephesians 521, because every follower of Christ is called to, to lower themselves up under others. And here, specifically, he's talking about being yielded to authorities over us. Now, we, we'll talk about this in other relationships at other times, but here he talks about being yielded to, uh, yielded to all, every human authority. And then he highlights emperors and governors. And I don't know what you know about the emperor and the governors at this time, but these were not good dudes. And yet... He tells the Christians then, and he tells the Christians now, that we are to submit ourselves to every human authority, even an evil governor and an evil emperor. Why? Why? Again, there's a lot here that, that we could unpack. We're not going to unpack everything. But what I want you to see is the power of verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So why, why, are, why are we called to do this? I would suggest it's because there is power in doing good in the face of adversity. Or put it another way, choosing to do good when things aren't great is powerful. There is powerful in, in doing those good things when you are treated harshly and poorly. Stay with me on this. There's a lot more. I want you, we're, we're going to weave through a handful of ideas, and then again, I'm going to really punctuate an idea at the end. So stay with me. Verse 16 says this, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Okay. Live as free people. What's that all about? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. I'm not going to turn you there. But Galatians 5, verse 1 talks about it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The freedom we're reading about here is freedom from sin. Do you know that as followers of Jesus, as those of us who've been chosen, who are part of the royal priesthood, who are part of the family of God, we are set free from sin, paid for by the blood of Christ. And he, here he says, live like that. Live free from your sin. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Just because you're free from sin doesn't mean it's okay to take liberties and do all type of terrible things. Instead, he says, live as God's slaves. What is that all about? Live as God's slaves. It's interesting. It's a bit of a play on words because in a moment, he's going to address the slaves receiving this letter. But before he addresses the slaves receiving this letter, he tells the followers of Christ that we are to live as slaves to God. What's that all about? Well, a slave is somebody who's been bought with a price. A slave is somebody who's been purchased. As followers of Jesus, Christ went to the cross, pouring his blood out for you and I to pay the price for your sin, for your life, and for my life. We have been bought with a price. Furthermore, because we've been bought by Jesus, we're called to live as one who's under the authority of Jesus. Live like slaves 
to God, live in obedience to God, live in a step with God, live following God wherever he takes you. It's a, it's, a, it's a weird image, it's a crude image, but it's a beautiful image. We are called to live in step and obedience with the one who lovingly paid the price for our lives with his life. Then we keep reading, there's more. Oh, I don't need to do that one. Verse 17. If you only knew what I was thinking half the time up here. Verse 17. <laughs> Again, the notes, they're just sec- recommendations. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. Okay, it's like everywhere we turn, there's hot subjects to talk about. Show proper respect to everyone. One of the things that's important for us to come back to a central idea of, of all scripture is that every human being on this planet is created in the image of God. Are you familiar with that idea? The image of God, go back to Genesis 1, Genesis 2. We're all created in the image of God. Even evil emperors and brutal governors, even coworkers that are harsh to you, even that person you don't want to talk to at church, everyone, every human on this planet is created in the image of God. In the Latin, it's the Imago Dei. And, and because we're each image bearers, that means that as I hang out with you, as I interact with you, there's something about the resemblance and image of God in each and every one of us. And because of that, we're called to treat everyone with honor, dignity, and respect. Because every human life, <laughs> every human life is significant and matters. Even the ones who don't know Jesus. So here he says in verse 17, show proper respect. It's this idea of honor to everyone. Then he ups the ante for the family of believers, love the family of believers. Then he throws in this idea, fear God. What's that all about, right? Fear God. I'll tell you what, for years of my journey of following Christ, I didn't know what to do with that phrase. The problem is it's all throughout the scriptures, so we can't ignore it for too long. And, and, and so uh, about a year ago, it really hit me afresh as, as I was uh, going through some teaching about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is this simple, simple, but big idea that God is so great and mighty and awesome and we stand in awe of him. There is none above him, none beyond him. And so we have a proper reverence to the God of the universe. And when our fear, of, uh, when, the, when the extent of our fear is a fear of God, then we will have no fear of anything or anyone else on this planet or in eternity. So we need to have a, a proper view of who God is, his majesty, his reverence, that everything else, all earthly authorities, even evil authorities, have to have ultimately come under the submission of a holy and awesome and mighty and powerful God. Are you getting that a little bit? And so he pulls up this idea of fear of God in the context of earthly authorities, earthly powers that are put over us that sometimes treat us wrongly. And, and verse, so verse 17, fear God and honor the emperor. Oh, we're back to that emperor thing again. Let's try to push on a little further. Now in verse 18, he's gonna now direct the, the teaching specifically to slaves. We've seen Peter do that in Ephesians as well. Uh, part of the, one of the things that really hit me when we were going through the Ephesians series last year is that, that when, when, the, when the early church was receiving these kind of letters and instructions, the early church was an incredibly diverse body. There was young people in the room. There were old people in the room. There were families in the room. There were kids in the room. There were uh, single people. There were eunuchs. There were uh, uh, slaves, in fact, uh, we spent a lot of time in the Ephesian church and there was a lot of slaves that made up that early church. And so as we're looking at some very practical teaching here and it makes sense that he would address the slaves, just like it might be practical for me to address college students in this room. I'm not making a parallel between college students and slaves, but as I'm saying it, it sounds like I could say some funny things, but I'm not going to. Hmm. If you only knew what was going on in my head most of the time. <laughs> okay, so now he directs it. To, he says, verse 18, slaves... In reverent fear of God. There it is again. So he's not going to ask them to do anything that doesn't come from a proper perspective of God. In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Now, to be clear, 
Christians would be some of the people who would work hard to bring an end to, to slavery in so many different parts of the world. And they would use the scriptures to do that. This is not one of those scriptures where we see a, a call to end slavery. This is a, a scripture written to people who are being treated harshly. It's not a call for you and I to do justice. This is, if you are facing all these harsh treatments, this is how to live. Out of a reverent fear of God, he's talking about submitting yourselves under this harsh authority. And then he continues, verse 19. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. From here on out, he's gonna point you and I to Jesus. He's gonna point you and I to the sufferings, to the pain, to the struggle of Jesus. And spoiler alert, every time you and I face a struggle, a hardship, a hurt, a pain, is an opportunity for you and I to find Jesus in a new and fresh way. That's where he's gonna take them. And that's where we're gonna to go today too. So stay with me. He continues, verse 20. But how is it to your credit? If you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, but if you suffer for doing good, and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So, so again, what's he doing there? As you face the hardships of a cruel slave owner, as you and I face the hardships of somebody in power over us, treating us harshly, is that possible that that could be a moment to remind us afresh of who Jesus is, what he did in going through the cross for us, the life he paid for for us, and being reminded afresh of all that he had to suffer for your life and for my life. And he endured it, it says. Christ suffered for you and I. And, and just in case you didn't get the idea, he continues, verse 22. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Just to be clear, Peter wants you and I to know that Jesus did nothing wrong, and yet Jesus faced all of that pain, didn't he? He was beaten. He was bruised. He was put on trial. He was bloodied and ultimately gave up his life, and yet he did nothing wrong. Verse 23, it's starting to get real right here. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no... What did he do? When he suffered, how did Jesus respond? He made no... Threats, huh? Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Think about that for a moment. When Jesus was facing all of that wrongful accusation, when Jesus was being hurt and harmed in so many ways by the authorities and powers of that time, he did not retaliate and he made no threats. There he was, he was suffering, and yet he did not retaliate and he made no threats. He was completely innocent, and yet he did not retaliate and he made no threats. How did he do that? It says in, at the end of verse 23, instead he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Who did he entrust his life to? God the Father. God the Father. It was the only way for him to live and, and navigate through that pain, through that struggle. And it is this image, this illustration that Peter would pull out to you and I who are sometimes treated poorly or sometimes hurt by those in power and authority over us and he points us to Jesus, the one as they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. And when he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted his whole life to him who judges justly. It's hard to entrust our life to the one who judges justly, isn't it? But it's the key to be able to respond like Jesus does in those moments of hurt, in those moments of pain. And then we come to the last two verses for today. He says this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of 
your souls. Did you see that phrase at the end of verse 24? One of the most powerful truths we need to hang out and, and meditate on today. By his wounds, you have been healed. You know, for years, I, I knew this as a beautiful theological truth about healing. But, but in the last few months, God has been using it to teach me afresh that by the wounds of Christ, I can find healing. That, that, that my healing flows out of his wounding. And what hit me afresh this summer is that as healing flows out of his wounds, I've been wrestling with this question, what flows out of my wounds? Healing flows out of the wounds of Jesus. Love flows out of the wounds of Jesus. Grace and redemption flow out of the wounds of Jesus. What flows out of our wounds? And one of the things that God's been challenging me on is that that perhaps there's a way if I entrust my life to God, that as I am wounded as a follower of Christ, as I am hurt as a follower of Jesus, as I entrust my life to him in those adverse situations, that only then is it possible for love and healing to flow out of my wounds too. I think that's one of the most beautiful things that could happen as we follow the one who is pierced and love flowed out. So the question we've been asking this morning is, how do we respond when things don't go the way we want? How do we respond when we are hurt by others? How do we respond when we are hurt by others in power? And what what hits me is there's so much hurt in our world today, isn't there? And perhaps you've heard the expression, hurt people hurt people. You heard that one? And what hits me as I see the scriptures today and I'm listening to the Holy Spirit is what if we were a people who ended the cycle of hurt? What if when we were wounded, we had so entrusted our lives to Christ that love and healing flowed out of our wounds? What if we ended the cycle of hurt and as followers of Jesus, love flowed from our pain? It's possible but it's only possible when we entrust our lives to Jesus. I I think the invitation for us today is this. When you are hurt, I want you to bring your pain to God and be honest with him. I want you to go to Jesus first and foremost, and I want you to scream out, yell out, leave all that pain right at Jesus, okay? And I want you to linger in that honest time with God as long as you need. Because the hurt we're talking about today is not some kind of philosophical ideal. It's real in the lives that you and I have, right? If you've been hurt, you know this is not a casual subject. That's one of the reasons why I don't love this message. But when we bring our real hurt to the God of the universe, the one who all authorities must bow down to, he can handle it. And I want you to hang out there and use all those ugly words that you're not, you're not, you're not comfortable using other places. Just this week, I was praying with somebody, and I heard all the ugly words directed to God. Bring your pain to him. By his wounds, we are healed. He already took all the pain. He can handle a couple of your ugly words, okay? And once you've laid it all out there for him, ask this question. Ask this question. What is the most healing choice that he would have me make right now? You've poured out that pain at his feet. Ask him, what is the most healing choice he would have you make right now? Remember, through his wounds, out of his wounds, love and healing poured out. How is he going to use you to end the cycle of hurt people hurting people? If we entrust our lives to Jesus, if we're obedient to the Holy Spirit, if we're obedient to the scriptures, he will show us how to respond. And guess what? If you're not clear on how to respond right away, don't respond. Hang out with the Lord until he makes it clear for you. And it may mean that you wait on that thing for years, but don't respond until God makes it clear to you. So we bring all that pain, all that hurt to God, 
And then we ask the question, what is the most healing, ask him, what is the most healing choice he would have us make right now? And we don't make that until we're clear with God what that is. Go back with me to Mandela's story, okay? So 27 years later, he was finally released. He stayed in prison for 27 years. Uh, At least two decades of those were in some of the harshest prison conditions he faced. Don't you think that while he sat in that prison that he just grew in his bitterness? That he became more angry and more bitter and more hurtful? But even though he wasn't a follower of Jesus, he didn't become bitter. In fact, when he came out, he had a deep conviction. I mean, again, he missed his mother's funeral because he was in prison. His marriage became a mess while he was in prison. His children grew up without their dad around. It was a ba- there was all kinds of reasons he could become embittered in that prison. In the same way so many of us in this room can become embittered in a prison of our pain. But it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. His blood has paid the price for your freedom. Today is the day where we entrust our lives to him and start walking in that freedom. So Mandela, he sat in that prison for 27 years. At the age of 72, he was finally released. A few short years later, he would become president of the nation of South Africa. He, 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 was, he won by a landslide. His people were the dominant ethnic people of this area. They could have taken over and made all kinds of things where like, it's revenge time. But he didn't. And he would endeavor to spend so many years trying to bring reconciliation and unity to his country, to his people. And the guy wasn't even a Christian. What would it look like for you and I? Men and women whose lives are bought with a price. Men and women who can find freedom through Christ to end the cycles of hurt in our world today, to end the cycles of hurt in your family today, end the cycles of hurt in your workplace today. And what if when we were pierced, love and healing flowed out of our wounds? I... um. I have more illustrations I could share with you, but uh, uh, let, me, let me share personally. Uh, this summer, I had many different opportunities to um, respond out of hurt. And, and, and to be honest, to be honest, I did not navigate these waters perfectly. In fact, I didn't share this with the first service, so I probably should share it with one of the services. There's this moment this summer where, um, failure story, where I, I, I got to this place where if you're new, we've had some stuff going on this last year. Um, I, I got to this point where I said, just maybe twice, I'm tired of defending our board. And, and that came out of a stupid place, if I'm honest with you. And, and, and a colleague called me on that. And they were right. And I had apologized for that. And what I was doing is in my exasper- exacerbation, I was trying to put my hurt elsewhere. And there were so many other opportunities I had this, this summer to, to go. I mean, I wanted to do some not good things. But I had some good people around me who loved Jesus, were praying with me. And over and over again, they called me to take a higher road. They called me to return love and, and grace instead of hurt for hurt. I need you to know this was not a perfect road for me. But I'm grateful that there were some men and women who guided me on this journey. One of the scriptures that, that God used to minister to me was uh, also not on the screen, Matthew 5.11, where, where Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And I held on to that, 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 that scripture for, for a long time as solace for not feeling treated right at times. But last week, I think in preparation for this message, God highlighted for me Romans 12.14. Romans 12, 14, where it says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Jesus calls us not just to endure hardship, not just to face the struggle, but to be a people who return blessing, who return love and healing, 
instead of returning hurt and bitterness. Guys, I don't know where you're at on this journey today. I know God has something different for every one of us in here. But what if we could become a people where love and healing flowed out of our wounds? What if we could become a people with lives so entrusted to Jesus that when we're poked, when we're wounded, people see Jesus in us more than, than ever? And I wonder, what if for us as a church, what if as a church, when we are wounded, when we are hurt, what if we could become a church of healing, a church of love, a church of graciousness? By his wounds, we are healed. What is going to flow out of our wounds? Would you pray with me? Hmm. God, when we speak of hurt, hurt's something that can run so deeply. There are some wounds in this place. And yet, God, we need to run to you today. I pray that we would find you to be our perfect heavenly physician, that where some of those wounds have been so bitter that you would rub your healing balm on those places where the idea of returning love and grace and healing to people who've wronged us seems so impossible. Would you remind us afresh that you are the God of the impossible? I wonder, God, are you, are you wanting to stir up something new in us? Are you wanting to do something new today and in the days ahead? God, would you make us a place of healing, a place of hope, a place of reconciliation? I pray that as you take us on this journey, we would see and experience you in new and fresh ways. You're good, God. You're good. So we worship you today. We cling to you today and I invite you to lead us on this journey, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.